Parvis Magna, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking, and this week I'm looking at the 2007 action-adventure game Uncharted Drake's Fortune. Uncharted is one of the best-selling video game franchises in history and raised the bar in pretty much every aspect of game design. They are praised for their stories, graphics, characters, level designs, music, innovation, gameplay, and basically everything else that goes into making a game. But before Uncharted got so big it earned the Tom Holland and Mark Wahlberg Hollywood budget, it was one game developed by one studio. That studio is Naughty Dog. They hadn't really made any games that had an impact before this, just Jack and Daxter and Crash Bandicoot. And a coot. After completing Jack 3, Naughty Dog looked to develop their first game for the new PlayStation 3 and assembled their most talented team to create a game focused on what they called stylized realism as opposed to the more cartoony designs of the previous generation of games. The project was codenamed Big, and directing this large ensemble was Amy Hennig, a Mr. Perfect choice if ever there was one. Amy also wrote this game alongside Josh Schur and Neil Druckmann. Uh. Inspiration was taken, obviously, from Indiana Jones, along with the Nicolas Cage film. National Treasure, and games like Resident Evil 4, Gears of War, and Kill Switch. Or. The game was released on November 20th, 2007 in North America and early December 2007 in the rest of the world. How does the beginning of the Dude Raider hold up after 14 years? Is it better than the movie? Does the second installment in this series divide people almost as much as politics? Stick around to hear me answer one of those questions, and let's give it everything we've got! The game begins with one of those old-timey inspirational quotes that takes like 25 words to say what could be said in 8. You know the kind. This quote was said by Sir Francis Drake, who you may be able to tell is kinda important to this whole thing. Sir Francis Drake is famous for circumnavigating the world in one voyage, establishing New Albion in what is now California, and a famous pirate the Spanish would brand El Drake. And along with being the Spanish way of saying Drake, it also means the dragon, since Drake is another way of saying dragon. And since Californians hate everything, and every one that isn't 100% perfect, strange coming from the state that manages to be on fire, drowning, and out of water all at the same time, a lot of the statues and buildings in Drake's honor have been torn down or renamed. You know, speaking of quotes, that reminds me of a pretty good one. But enough about that Drake, he is dead. We're here to talk about Nathan Drake, a supposed ancestor of Sir Francis who just found his coffin at the bottom of the ocean. But there's no body in that coffin, just a journal. Rest in peace, journal. Nathan isn't too keen on sharing this journal with his camerawoman though, using the trident true method of semantics to justify his decision. Before Elena Fisher here can lawyer her way into the journal, a group of pesky Panamanian pirates show up to rain on their parade with bullets. This is the introduction to this game's cover-based combat system, which Elena is very good at. Some of the pirates will climb aboard the boat, but Nathan's been training for when he eventually confronts Batman so he can melee them with relative ease. He can also loot ammo and later guns. I'd also like to mention that this game is divided into chapters, though they aren't really indicative of anything major, so I won't be noting every time the game enters a new chapter. Because this game is basically a 2000s action movie, Nathan and Elena jump off the boat right as it explodes, and they're rescued by Nate's business partner, Victor Sullivan. Sully for short. They have an expositional conversation about Sir Francis Drake's lost diary, filled with 2000s action movie dialogue. A man only interested in the climax. He must be a real hit with the ladies. Never had any complaints. The journal contains a map pinpointing the location of El Dorado, the mythical lost city of gold, but a page is missing. And since the pair don't really feel like putting up with competition, they speed off without Elena so she can't put their discovery on the news. Now on an unnamed South American island off the coast of Panama, wait a minute, they stumble across some ancient ruins, which serves as a perfect introduction to Nathan Drake's platforming skills. He can jump, he can climb, he can shimmy, he can push. And push he does, right into some tunnels and into a large chamber. This is the introduction to the usually easy puzzles Nate will sometimes have to solve to progress, like shooting an explosive barrel or pushing a cart. But those are just curtain jerkers to the puzzling main event. Nate will recognize something from Drake's journal, which will tell him what to do to progress. This is a recurring mechanic, and it only gets annoying some of the time. Nate uses the fire from the brazier to burn down the blockade and does some hardcore parkour because his name is Nathan Drake down to a lower level, where he uncovers a ladder for Sully's lame ass. Okay, that's a bit unfair. Nate wouldn't be able to light lamps without him. That's worth something. Nate presses some symbols with help from the jure and progresses down into some very stagnant water. Soon after emerging, he can find a silver llama. As the game says, there are 60 treasures scattered throughout, and I will not be going over all of them. All I will say is that all of them are entirely missable, so if you're going for 100%, pay close attention to every room you're in. Nate emerges on the other side and breaks down the walls like it's 1989 before crossing a room that's just as stable as it looks. On the other end, Nate and Sully see a large depression in the wall that's used to house a golden idol and realize 
says that's El Dorado, not a city, but it was taken by those damn Spaniards centuries ago. Following the trail of the cut logs used to carry El Dorado leads to the discovery of a German U-boat. What? You act like you've never seen a German U-boat in the middle of the jungle before. Luckily, there aren't any Nazis aboard, at least not the alive variety, just some really old gold coins, a captain ripped to shreds, <laughs> well there can only be one, you know, and a missing page to Drake's journal that pinpoints the location of El Dorado. However, Sully's walkie-talkie cuts out as Nate is conveying all this information, and he rushes back to encounter Gabriel Roman and his lieutenant, Atok Navarro. Hey, I went to school with someone with the last name Navarro. Any chance you're related? I certainly hope not. Nate is forced to hand over the map, but that doesn't stop Roman from shooting Sully. Oh no! Nate runs from them straight into Elena, who managed to follow them here. You know, it's nice to see a friendly- <laughs> Okay, yeah, he deserved that one. But come on, his friend just got shot in front of him, Elena. Not cool. Together, the two of them fight through the ruins, while we don't question how a single treasure hunter and a journalist are able to not only hold their own, but overcome an entire band of soldiers. Eventually, they make it to an escape vehicle and come to a sort of agreement. I'll get the story, and you get- Whatever it is you're after. Elena, he just told you about a map revealing the location of El Dorado. What do you think he's after? Do you have a good memory? Yeah, well WRONG! We cut to Nate and Elena flying toward the island on the map, but their arrival is interrupted by the small interruption of their plane being shot at. Nate lets Elena escape while he keeps the plane as steady as he can and then jumps out himself. A foolproof plan, but there's one hole in it. Now separated, Nate explores the island and has to deal with an insane amount of enemies given how early in the game it is, which distracts from how great the scenery looks, especially for a PlayStation 3 game in 2021. Granted, it's the remastered Nathan Drake collection version on a PlayStation 4, but there's only so much possible a remaster can add. Just look at Resident Evil. However, in trying to make this game as stylishly realistic as possible, they created the most annoying aspect of the game. There is no indication of what platforms and ledges can be reached and what can't, so you'll often fall either to your death or all the way back to the beginning, and it's hard to say which is worse. It does make the game more immersive, and odds are eventually you'll develop a sixth sense that can sort of detect the right path, but it's still annoying. Now that Nate's done being shot at, he discovers the wreckage of the plane and is shot at some more. You're starting to give me Outlast 2 vibes game, and trust me when I say that is not something you want to do. Nate climbs into the plane wreckage because his dumb ass left the crucial map behind and sees that Elena landed on a weird castle wall thing. God only knows how though, she jumped out first, how did she land closer to the plane? Would you believe me if I said Nathan Drake is shot at again? Because he does, quite a few times actually, before he arrives outside the fortress walls. I know I just complained about this, but the platforming sections are where this game is the strongest. It's just fun climbing through ruins or up a wall or through a forest. They play with it a lot more in the sequels, but this is still fun since not many games had stuff like this. I can only think of one other series off the top of my head that had something similar. A series that was also PlayStation exclusive featured a kind-hearted thief obsessed with an ancestor's book as the main character and has Nolan North in it. Huh. But since Naughty Dog thinks Stealthy Thief translates to massive gunfights every two seconds, it's not long before the next one. Nate finds Elena's parachute with no sign of Elena, but no need to fear because he sees that she's alive and well a few seconds later. What the hell is she doing? Yeah, I wonder what that journalist is doing while she waves her camera around. Nate exchanges some Indonesian with someone, which results in, you guessed it, more gunfights. He fights his way inside and then back outside and then retrieves the key to the key door atop the tower that doesn't have a tower door. His reward is more gunfights. On the way, he comes across a note from Sir Francis Drake etched into the wall, thus revealing that he made it to the island long ago, though never officially documented it. Nate makes his way over to the tower Drake mentioned in his note and notices a familiar looking building. He just so happens to spot Elena looking at the same fucking building of all things, but his valiant rescue is interrupted by big guns and poor architecture. He wakes up in a cell thanks to Elena, who promises to get him out. While she does that, Nate talks to Eddie Raja, who he has undefined history with. Eddie accuses him of working with an enemy group, and since Eddie is fully and completely incompetent, he doesn't notice as Elena attaches a hook to the wall and just rips the whole thing clean off. He also sticks both hands through the bars, allowing Nate to snag his map back before escaping. Now it's another gunfight. Unrails this time. Well, technically on Jeep, but you get the idea. There are several vehicle sections in this game, and none of them are that great. This one isn't terrible, it's just painfully easy. Every vehicle goes down in just a few shots. It's all in vain though, since they get cornered by Eddie. Well, they would be cornered if it wasn't for Big Dick Drake over here. After they get back on land, Nate suddenly wants to give up and go home, despite Elena being committed to finding El Dorado. They set aside the argument and board a jet ski. 
Oh yay, another vehicle section. And this one is much worse. Not only are you in charge of the jet ski which controls like socks and a fucking ice rink, you are also in charge of shooting the enemies in the large quantities of explosive barrels. After clearing those chaotic combustible canals, Elena mentions rumors of a cursed Inca treasure that might explain the whole colony that used to live on the island that straight up vanished. Nate shrugs it off and they immediately refocus on getting into that familiar building they spotted earlier since that's where all the ships come in and out of. The jet ski joyride isn't over yet though since Nate only exits the thing to open the gate so they can progress further. You ever just desperately want a protagonist to fail at something? Elena drops Nate off so he can access the tower. He fights through another gathering of men and climbs the tower from the inside, providing the perfect place to ponder how Raja has so many people working for him. Nate rides the rope with his gun like a cool guy into the customs house and lets Elena in. They find a room with all the shipping manifests, including the last page, a drawing of El Dorado. This amazes Elena so much that she turns into Owen Wilson. And then they have a conversation about the ring Nate's been wearing this whole time in a way that people aren't meant to wear rings. Sick Parvis Magna? Greatness from small beginnings. It was his motto. Nate explains that the ring is dated one day after Sir Francis Drake's supposed death, and there are coordinates etched into it that reveal the location of the coffin from the beginning. Elena tries to convince Nate to continue the search for El Dorado, but he doesn't budge. A gunfight later, and the two of them spot the boat they're going to use for their escape on the other side of the harbor. Elena requests to stay put while Nate gets the boat. Nate thinks she's up to something, but I think she's just tired. Have you seen how much they've done today? After some fun and new gameplay sections, I'm <laughs> just kidding, it's two more gunfights, including one that I think is still going on. Nate makes it to the boat, but he's stopped by Elena and we learned the real reason she stayed behind was because the game needed her to capture the footage of Gabriel Roman and Atok Navarro, remember them, and Sully's still alive. Elena thinks Sully's working with them, but Nate doesn't believe it. Their next destination is the monastery in the mountains where they believe they'll find Sully. Their journey includes a walk across the bridge, which offers another shiny example of Elena's ability to listen. Ooh. Watch where you step. Knock knock. Who's there? Gunfight. Gunfight who? Gunfight me if you like these jet ski sections. Oh, but don't worry, they found a way to make it worse. This time, the entire path is upstream. So stay still for even one second and your ass is getting carried back. Upon arriving as close as they can to the monastery entrance, they make a startling discovery. This is from our plane. There are also like three conversations in a row that just don't finish. Thanks to a talkative guard, Nate and Elena learn where Sully is being held and slaughter about 100 more people on their way over there. When they finally rescue Sully, he reveals that Sir Francis Drake's journal took most of the impact from the shot and that El Dorado is hidden somewhere within the monastery. They just have to follow the clues in the journal. And this time, they aren't going to leave Elena behind. I mean, it's not like they have a reason to anyway, she lost her camera hours ago. Solving a puzzle that is whatever is the opposite of directionless leads them to a secret hidden library that's been hiding in the library, and another puzzle solution opens up the land of the dead, which does not sound like a place you want to go into. Nate decides to go it alone, leading to humor that manages to be dated, yet still relevant all at the same time. Nate, be careful. <laughs> Come on, I always am. Ah! I did not see that! Descending further down in the land of the dead and coming across a startling amount of enemies in a place that only Nate, Sully, and Elena knows exists and just opened minutes ago, Nate finds himself under a floor grate, allowing him to overhear a conversation between Roman, Navarro, and Raja. Raja was hired to capture Nate and secure the island so Roman could take the treasure, but obviously he failed. Raja says the island is cursed and curses Roman and Navarro out. Nate emerges back outside which begs the question, why was going through the land of the dead necessary to find El Dorado if they could have just gone around, and then he enters a church where he finds a stained glass window illustrated in the journal. It's not long after that he discovers the building in which the treasure is hidden, and it just so happens to be the building Sully sent Roman and Novaro to as a red herring. Nate tells Sully and Elena to meet him there and says this. Now I've just got to get past all these goons without getting noticed. Let's see how he plans on doing that. <laughs> yeah, that'll do it. Nate finishes his sneaky entrance and meets up with Sully and Elena. How? Nate told them to follow the path he went through. How did they cross all of that and make it inside before Nate? Regardless, Nate solves a revolutionary puzzle to open a hidden door. He and Elena make it through, but Nate realizes it's a trap and pushes Sully back out before the door closes on him instead of pulling him through so they're all together. You aren't smooth, Nate. We've all had crushes before. Inside the vault is an impossibly large room that Nate has to scale in a certain order that really stretches the realism and stylized realism, but this game's got an Indiana Jones and who am I to argue? Nate 
makes it across and opens the gate for Elena, so that they can cross another impossibly large room. But this time, Eddie Raja shows up and tasks his men with killing them. This is probably my favorite gunfight in the game, as the large area isn't built for a gunfight like pretty much every other area they occur in. It's the most cinematic feeling fight, and you don't even need to kill them all to progress. They make it into a room, and Nate finds the corpse of Sir Francis Drake. He helps Elena scale a ladder, but their forward progress is interrupted by Eddie and a soldier of his, and something has them spooked. Oh no. Oh god, no. We're trapped. Jesus, what is that? We're dead. We're all dead. Eddie, get back here. What? You didn't know this was actually a zombie game the whole time? The seemingly endless barrage of zombie creatures is temporarily interrupted when Eddie Raja gets Eddie ravaged by a zombie. Nate fights them off for a bit longer before Elena lowers a rope for him. They run from the creatures right into a room that really clashes with the ancient aesthetic of the rest of the area. They find a paper that indicates El Dorado was found by the Germans who built this facility and they carried it somewhere else because of course they did. But in order to escape, Nate has to explore the facility and find a way to restore power. All the while, avoiding more zombies because this section of the game feels like a completely different game. Seriously, you have to switch up your entire play style to fight these things. It's no longer about hiding behind cover and shooting carefully, it's about constantly moving around and spraying them with bullets. Nate will flip a switch and then have to fight another swarm of them just to flip another switch and repeat the whole process. Eventually, he stumbles across video footage of El Dorado and a chained up zombie, in the torn out page of Francis Drake's journal that mentions that El Dorado is cursed and responsible for turning the Spaniards into those zombie creatures. He destroyed the city and the boats so that the gold couldn't leave the island. Huh, what a terrible page to not include in the journal that details exactly how to find El Dorado. Nate makes his way to a control room across from the one they entered in, just in time to see Roman and Navarro take Elena hostage and head off to El Dorado. Oh, and now Nate has to fight through zombies and an army in what is definitely the worst action set piece in the game. It's ridiculously long and difficult, and filled with things like a sniper rifle for enemies 6 feet in front of you and shotguns for enemies 30 feet away. Since Naughty Dog didn't think that bullshit was enough gunfighting, Nate immediately enters two more to save Sully and then enter the building with the entrance to El Dorado's hiding place. When they get there, they confront Roman and Navarro. Navarro betrays Roman by getting him to open El Dorado and get infected by the curse, putting a bullet in his head before he can fully transform. His extraction of El Dorado is interrupted by the zombified Spaniards. Position. allowing Nate and Sully to get the better of their captors and chase after Navarro. Nate grabs onto the neck containing El Dorado and the helicopter crashes onto the extraction ship. Nate fights through one final group of enemies to make it to Navarro. And the final showdown between our main character and the villain who is in the background for 99% of the game is like six quick time events. After that, Nate saves Elena and sends Navarro to the bottom of the ocean with El Dorado. Sully shows up with a pile of loot so their adventure that saved the world and fought off ancient evil wasn't all in vain, and Nate promises to give Elena another story as our heroes ride off into the sunset. Like I said, 2000s action movie. The best way I can summarize this game is flashes of brilliance in a sea of monotony. Nathan Drake is a very charming and dynamic protagonist who has more layers than one would expect from his archetype, and the performance from Nolan North makes him even more likable. Victor Sullivan is great for the admittedly small portion of the game he's in, and I like that they avoided the obvious and kept Sully loyal to his friend. Elena's performance is probably the weakest of the main three, but I put the blame not on Emily Rose, but on Naughty Dog for not getting more takes of certain lines that weren't delivered as well as they could have been. The production quality would only increase with time though, so it's not a lasting issue. None of the villains are too particularly memorable, especially since the twist villain emerges with about 5-10 to 10 minutes left. The game has a heavy over-reliance on massive gunfights that create a heavy sense of ludonarrative dissonance, as this scrappy and likable adventurer has no problem slaughtering hundreds of people. It's an issue that plagues the first three games, but it's the most obvious here. The puzzle and adventuring sections aren't nearly long enough to make up for the plethora of gunfights fights, and the jeep and jet ski sections aren't improvements. The story is straight out of an action movie of the time, and in an age where we have games like Ghost of Tsushima, Batman Arkham Knight, and even Uncharted 4, it's hard to understand how groundbreaking this was at the time. The island setting isn't too dynamic, but I always prefer shades of blue and green in a setting over shades of orange and red, so at least it has that going for it. Uncharted, Drake's Fortune gets a 6 out of 10. The moments between the characters and exploration of the island are great, but they are way too often interrupted by 
long and sometimes boring gunfights that betray the narrative. If you were disappointed in the Lost City of Gold not being a lost city, then come back next week to see if we find another one. And hopefully this one won't be a sham. I hope to see you there. Marco!